Hello, everybody. Uh, this presentation uh, is uh, coming at the end of the Lagemon project, and uh, it will try to give some experience on the questions that we have facing by evaluating the four genetic monitoring exercise. Well, um, as we have already discussed, the main idea of conservation genetics is to conserve genetic diversity. And in order to conserve genetic diversity, uh, as by this way, we can ensure uh, population survival, conservation uh, uh, besides genetic component of biodiversity, also of biodiversity at large, is uh, to monitor especially the areas where this conservation of biodiversity is being um, applied in situ. So what genetic monitoring does uh, is it provides a way for a temporal evaluation of genetic uh, diversity. So uh, the way to do that is by evaluating the gynecological um, uh, approach, uh, which means that uh, by evaluating natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow making systems at micro scale. And to do that, uh, we, th this exercise of evaluation has to be repeated over time at uh, shorter time intervals for phenotypic demographic measurements and at longer time intervals for genetic markers, in this case, for instance, at every 15 years. Um, the, some of the major constraints of for genetic monitoring and science as well, is that at the start, there is a lack of historical data. Um, the use of proxies and sometimes in already available genetic diversity data. And the third and a major constraint in this respect is the ab absence of established protocols on how to evaluate this data in terms of evaluating the difference between the baseline assessment and subsequent assessments. And this is what I'm going to discuss in this presentation as genetic monitoring. Uh, of course, it accumulates historical data, is using actual genetic diversity and differentiation values to do that rather than proxies. And the idea is that for genetic monitoring generally, generally operates on reference points. So on particular values rather than on thresholds. So in this respect, we refer to reference points as specific points of a biological system that uh, describe measurable properties, which are used as ben benchmarks for, for instance, for genetic resource um, management. While thresholds are, are reference points that trigger a response uh, when this point um, the, or overcoming this point leads to uh, possible irreversible harm. Okay, so the importance of defining thresholds for genetic monitoring has been first addressed in this paper, a 1996 paper. Um, and the main person behind this paper and the main person for evaluating um, for genetic monitoring assessment was Jin Nam Kung. Uh, a great uh, researcher, professor, a person that I had the privilege to know well um, in person myself. So Jean, along with Tim Boyle, uh, Gregorius, uh, um, uh, Otis and Vicky Ratman, etc., cetera, um, Ellen Zoli, have developed the first uh, threshold um, um, indications for, for genetic monitoring. And then many years later, I wrote a paper on this issue, uh, uh, proposing some uh, thresholds, um, followed by a paper by uh, Sean Hoban as the uh, main author. Again, thresholds for uh, indicators uh, have been discussed. Um, uh, I also wrote another paper on this issue, and lately, uh, Mike Bruford has uh, uh, written a similar paper indicating the need for thresholds for, for genetic monitoring. But out of these papers, uh, particular numbers, particular values on thresholds come out, out of this uh, uh, paper, first paper by Jinnam Kungen et al. 
And then uh, by a similar paper by Tim Boyle in uh, uh, this famous book on force conservations and ethics, and then by the papers that I have uh, produced myself, other papers do not refer to specific thresholds. So um, what I will try to do is to present the work we did in, in, life, in uh, Life and Moon, uh, trying to show uh, what is our approach with this kind of thresholds. And in fact, three different levels of critical difference, of course, statistical, statistically significant difference, the second level, we have statistically significant difference, but 25% uh, difference from the previous value. And in the third case, 50% above the previous value. So these three levels. And if you see here for the uh, different types of uh, uh, parameters that we use in sending monitoring, which are the verifiers, um, you can see on the screen uh, the methods of comparison. Uh, which can be um, either a, a parametric test, mainly an ANOVA application, such as, such as a t-test, or if we have non-parametric data and non-parametric test, uh, like Kruskal Valis, but Man Whitney can be applied as well in most cases. Uh, there is one exception with effective population size where current literature suggests that the minimum threshold of 500 has to be followed. Uh, linkages equilibrium and the little frequencies are uh, two cases that uh, also deviate from the general model. In the case of allele frequencies, uh, Fisher's exact tests are preferred, and if we have higher frequency uh, values, uh, Z test, for instance. And in the case of linkages equilibrium, well, this is a more specific case. Um, but uh, um, uh, the parameters to evaluate can be um, further uh, tested by a Spearman rank uh, correlation test. Okay, the levels of critical difference among temporal evaluations, uh, one level of difference, uh, statistically significant differences and uh, uh, outside the 95% confidence interval, that's the first level of response. Uh, which is to consult foresters on the field situation. Um, the second case is that we have these statistically significant differences, uh, but also 25% difference from the previous assessment. And that's a second level of response, which would lead to the revision of silvicultural and management schemes and facilitation of natural regeneration. Uh, again, of course, by consulting foresters. And the third level of uh, response uh, um, uh, is linked to statistically significant difference and 50% difference from the previous assessment. And that third level of response requires, of course, intensive in situ monitoring and uh, uh, consideration of taking ex situ measurements. So uh, along with the critical difference level, we have these different levels of response and the linked action to its response. Uh, but then because we have several verifiers per uh, um, indicator, uh, several parameters per indicator, then what happens if not all of these verifiers show the same trend? So we do not have in all statistically significant differences shown in the deterioration of the uh, uh, genetic quality of this uh, uh, population. In that case, um, we have to have um, a number of verifiers over total that shows a negative trend. For instance, in the case of the basic level, where we have mortality, natural generation abundance, fructification and flowering, we need three out of, out of four to show a negative trend in order to take action. And then we have a condition that uh, um, one of them has to be definitely, in this case, natural generation. So the same holds true for the standard level where we have more parameters. So six out of 10 parameters, and then two must definitely show a negative trend. And in the third level of force genetic monitoring, the advanced level, we, have, we need to have eight out of 13 parameters, show a negative trend, and three parameters among them should be uh, among the ones that show this negative trend. So by this proposal, uh, we think we can uh, a, a, a apply genetic monitoring over time and in fact, produce results regarding evaluations with negative trends, 
depending on the uh, type of verifiers and the number of verifiers out of the total that present a negative threat. This is one of the results that we expect to publicize in the manual for force genetic monitoring, which is today under preparation for this, uh, for this project. But of course, um, this concerns the consecutive measurements, but as we have discussed before, there are more market assessments to be made. So what is happening when you don't have a difference between two consecutive assessments, but we have, for instance, a difference between the baseline data and the analysis at, uh, uh, in 30 years time, for instance. Um, well, this is a, a difficult problem. Um, as my uh, lead co-author and, and uh, uh, colleague and uh, uh, part of the same uh, um, working group, Mariana Westergren has uh, pointed out, uh, this leads to the boiling frog uh, exercise. So the gradual change does not uh, uh, imply uh, perhaps some uh, uh, reason for concern, uh, while a big change does. Uh, and in this case, of course, uh, we have to be very careful how to evaluate this trend. Is it very gradual? Is the selection gradient very steep or not? This is something that is still under debate. And uh, uh, with, with this last notion, I would like to thank you for your uh, uh, attention to this presentation. I would like to thank uh, the Largemont Project that gave us all this opportunity to do this uh, work. And thank you all for your attention.